Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we're looking at verses 27 to 30. And if you've been following us in this study, you know that it's really intensifying. Things are really intensifying. Mark chapter 8. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me one more time. Just stand out of honor of the Word of God, and I want to read these verses. If you just follow along, I hope you have your Bible. Follow along in your Bible. If not, we have the text on the screens for you, and we would like to uh, help you secure a Bible. Verse 27. It's going to sound familiar because we just read similar verses in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them, to tell no one about him. What have we read here together today? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us today from this text about this great confession. How some of you need to make it for the first time. And those of us who are followers of Christ need to keep this confession in our hearts and on our tongues. More than ever, our society, our culture needs to hear this great confession. Thank you. Be seated. What you and I know as the eighth chapter of Mark, and we've gone through this, has been filled with, with intrigue and instruction. The chapter begins with Jesus miraculously feeding 4,000 men he had previously fed 5,000 men and, and their families. Then also after that, he, he defends himself from an accusation made by the Pharisees and uses that as an opportunity to warn his disciples about what he calls the leaven of the Pharisees, to not be like them. He heals another blind man. A different kind of healing. It's a gradual healing, not, not instantaneous like the previous healings we had seen recorded. And I suppose as we've moved through those verses and come to where we are today, the most piercing thing said is when Jesus turns to his disciples who, who are fussing among one another because somebody forgot to bring the bread. And he said, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? And it's this occasion that prompts him to begin the unveiling of what theologians call the messianic secret. We've, we've seen him throughout the Gospel of Mark after a miracle say, now tell no one about this. The man that he heals gradually who was blind, he says, don't even go back into the city where you were. And this passage contains the great confession. You see, the movement from death to life, from spiritual death to spiritual life, the movement along the journey of life, should have these elements about it. There should be a time in your life when you can look back and say, it was then, not necessarily a day and a date, but it was then that I made that great confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But not with lips only, not just something come out of your lips, but what, what Paul described in Romans 11, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, he says. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Paul says that because the very next verse he says, For it's with the heart that a person believes and is justified. 
And it's with the mouth that confession is made to salvation. In other words, salvation begins in the heart. The great confession begins in the heart. It's a work of the Holy Spirit we call the new birth or regeneration or being born again. It begins in the heart that a person believes and is justified, declared not guilty and accepted as righteous in the sight of God only for the work of Jesus Christ and our simple childlike faith in him. It begins in the heart works its way out the mouth. Here's the concern today as we move through this passage. No one can truly, sincerely, meaningfully, redemptively call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Anybody can say it with their mouth, I believe in Jesus, Jesus is Lord. But not, not savingly. Matthew's Gospel, of course, commends Peter for what he said. There's that great confession. And once you make the great confession, then you're, you're faced with the great commandment. When they tried to trick Jesus, they said, well, tell us, what's the greatest commandment? He said, well, the greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the great commandment is this call to love God and to love others, to love God with all that we are, and the outflow of that being to love one another. And that great commandment follows. It's the exhortation that comes to everyone who's made the great confession. And then there's the great commission. And you see, the great commission is meaningful only to those who've made the great confession and who have embraced the great commandment. And so we see in this passage here, and its companion in Matthew 16, the beginning of Jesus unfolding who he is. The next passage we study in Mark, Lord willing, will show us that he begins to tell them that he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer greatly. He's going to be crucified. He's going to rise again. It's the first time he does that. So let's look at this passage today. Think about this. Who do you say that Jesus is? I want to read the Matthew passage again just real quickly, verses 17 to 20. So Matthew includes this in his account of this episode, whereas Mark leaves it out. And I think there's a reason that he does, by the way. I, if Mark is writing Peter's memoirs, which we believe he, he is, it stands to reason that Peter would not have included the commendation that Jesus made to him. Matthew 16, verse 17, though Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, that is the rock of, of this great confession of faith in Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is built upon the rock of, of people making the great confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, and really the tense is, is significant here, whatever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. And then, as our verse 30 says, he charged them strictly to tell no one. I want us to see three things briefly in this passage today. First, the public opinion of Jesus. Second, the disciples' opinion of Jesus. And third, Jesus' admonition to his disciples' answer. This public opinion of Jesus where he asks in verses 27 and 28, who do the people say that I am? Everyone who knew about Jesus had an opinion about him. The same is true today. Isn't it interesting what the disciples said was what they had heard from the people. These answers they give, there's not, there's not a negative among them. The only people who spoke negatively of Jesus at this point were the religious leaders. The common population admired him, esteemed him. Whether they'd ever met him or not, if they'd only heard of him, they still, look what they had to say. They say John the Baptist. Well, in order to be John the Baptist, he would need to be someone who's come back to life. Others say Elijah. Same thing's true. To be Elijah, you'd have to come back to life. 
and others, one of the prophets. Same thing's true. All the prophets already did by this time. And at first glance, we read this and we say, well, isn't it wonderful that they had such kind things to say about him? But folks, that's a devilish trap. We used to hear, I don't, know, I don't know if it's this prevalent anymore with the changes in the culture, but you used to hear, well, I believe Jesus was a good man. I believe Jesus did a lot of good. I believe Jesus was an extraordinary teacher. And I, I believe that some of the miracles recorded that he probably performed. But you see, what's the problem with all that? All of those stop way short of what needs to be said of Jesus. Who do the people say that I am? What's the public opinion? And dear people, we, could, we should never stop short of that. It's okay to speak those things that, that he's, he is a friend to sinners. He is my guide and my friend. But, but the most important reality about Jesus is that he is the Messiah as we just sang, the name above all names, the blessed Redeemer, the, the Emmanuel, God, come among us. Rescuing sinners, ransoming sinners. We must always ourselves declare and move others to, from the heart, declare that Jesus is the Christ. So let's look at that's what the population said. That's what the public opinion was of Jesus, except, of course, for the Pharisees, for the Sanhedrin, the, the most religious of the culture. They called him all sorts of things. Second thing I want you to see, though, is what the disciples' opinion of Jesus is. Peter speaks first, quickly. We know him through the gospel accounts as very impetuous. He will move quickly, even sometimes in error. But not this time. His swift move is right on point. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. Peter answered, you are the Christ. The word Christ in the Greek, is, it's not even translated in our English language. It's, it's simply as Christos in the Greek, and it's brought over. It's transliterated into English. You're the Christ. It is the Greek equivalent, Christos, of the Old Testament word Messias, which is, again, just brought over as Messiah. The, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the, the one appointed by God to come and save people from their sins, this is quite a declaration Peter is making because you see, no one around them, no one outside this group would have asserted that. In fact, for Peter to say that publicly would be considered blasphemy. This is the sent one. This is the one that God has sent to Israel. It would have been considered blasphemy. But Peter declares it nonetheless. And of course, as we read in Matthew, Jesus commends that. Blessed are you. Simon, son of John. Because what you said is not something that you picked up from public opinion or from religious persuasion. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You're not simply mimicking, repeating something you've heard. But this has been revealed to you by my Father in heaven. You have spoken a divine revelation. You have spoken a saving revelation. What you have spoken has come from your heart, a heart that's been gripped by the Spirit of God convincing you that though the populace has one perspective on you and the religious elite have a drastically different perspective on you, you have managed to declare who I am. Blessed are you. It's important to note that Jesus did not say, now Simon, you're making way too much of me. You're giving me way too much credit. No. Jesus gladly received that and blessed Simon for saying it and told Simon of the source 
of it. My brothers and sisters, we're entering strange times in this country. It's not a time that where we should doubt. It's not a time where we should fear. They're just very different times. I read an article yesterday about pastors in the state of Kentucky who have served in their Department of Juvenile Justice. They've served as counselors to wayward youth. And they're being fired one by one when they're asked, do you believe that homosexuality is a sin? And when they answer yes, they are terminated. Kentucky. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is in Kentucky. And other divinity schools are in Kentucky. We're living in a different day. Some of you within my hearing, hearing of my voice, who are followers of Jesus Christ will be asked at some point in your job setting, do you believe, fill in the blank, homosexuality, same-sex relationships, abortion, on and on, is sin. And when you answer in the affirmative, you will be terminated from the marketplace. Again, don't fear that. There's no need to fear those who can, can only uh, do harm to us physically. The scripture says to fear him who takes both body and soul and casts it into hell. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. If you're ashamed of me, then I will say in heaven, I never knew you. This is a bold declaration. But it's got to come from more than the lips. It, in fact, it cannot start at the lips and have any meaning at all. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. A heartfelt, spirit-empowered faith that Jesus died and rose again. And to reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to remove yourself from being able to speak savingly, meaningfully, Jesus is Lord. You can still say it. In fact, if you take a, a, a cockatoo or a, a, a parrot, you can teach a parrot to say Jesus is Lord if you work with him long enough. There's no magic in the words. The question is, where does it come from? Does it simply come as a thought? Or does it come as a heart conviction? Jesus is Lord. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. We must be ready to say that. We must be ready to introduce him to those who don't know him. I think that part of the problem, part of the way that's gotten our culture the way it is, is that, that we believe these things, but we have been hesitant to speak them in the parks, on the school grounds, in the classroom, in the workplace at the grocery store, in the neighborhood. And our silence, though we might say we believe it, our silence is bringing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the West under condemnation. And there's a house cleaning coming, make no mistake about it. It's coming. Those who only speak of Jesus as Lord from their lips as long as things are convenient and everything's okay will be called away from those who from the depths of their soul no matter what the consequences will be declare Jesus as Lord now now lest we think this is something very bold and courageous for us let me remind you there are brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world who faced this. The first generation of Christians in the first century before the Romans would be called to the magistrate and sometimes even placed in the, in the uh, arena, in the spectacle in Rome, the Colosseum, before the masses who were there out of bloodthirst and be called upon right there to, to look at the Caesar who was sitting in his, in his throne perched high in the Colosseum and would be told, confess Caesar Hakurios. Caesar is Lord. 
And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. And they would say, no, Jesus, Akurios, Jesus is Lord. And they would die in many different ways that would make Isis look tame. That was how Christianity was met in the first century. And in the 21st century, while we have had the opportunity to be at ease in Zion, our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world face death because they dare say Jesus is the Lord. I have no doubt that the voodoo temple that our folks visited where the pastor's wife spoke to the temple prostitutes, where the gospel tracks were handed. I have no doubt that that voodoo priest will put a bullseye on the congregation at Dejun. Will terrify the people around them. Don't associate with those Christians. Bad things will happen to you. That's the price being paid all around the world. And Jesus would ask you today, who do you say that I am? How do you answer? From where do you answer? If it's simply off the lips? That's what's called notional faith. It's just an idea but if it comes from deep within you, if it comes from a stirring in your heart where you've been gripped by the glorious grace of God and shown, as Peter discovered early in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus caused the miraculous catch of fish, Peter looked at Jesus and said, Depart from me, Lord. I, I am a sinful man. I'm not worthy of your presence. Peter went from being greatly gripped by his sin to gloriously gripped by the saving grace of God in Christ. Who do you say that Jesus is? Oh, fellow Christian, we cannot be silent any longer. We must declare in love with boldness, without any thought of what the retribution might be, Jesus is the Christ. What he says is sin is sin. What he says is righteousness is righteousness. What his path is is the only way to travel. And I will not deviate. Who do you say? Jesus says, have you made the great confession? I'm speaking to some here today who've never, you've, you've hung around religion. Maybe you were raised in a religious setting. Maybe not. But you've never come face to face with the claims that Jesus would make upon you. And you've never stared in the face this question. Who do you say Jesus is? And my prayer is for those who have never confessed faith in Christ that today, Having seen the power of the gospel emphasized in baptism, death, burial, and resurrection, knowing that you've not yet died to yourself, you've, your old ways have not been buried, you've not been raised to walk in a newness of life. If someone were to ask you, when did, the, when did the change come in your life where you ceased living essentially for yourself and began living primarily for Jesus Christ, his word, his will, his way, you would have to answer honestly, never. Oh, today, that you would take seriously the confession that Jesus demands because you see, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. And those who've never confessed him while on this planet and who think they can confess him at the judgment will hear him say, I never knew you. Depart into outer darkness. Have you made the great confession of faith in Christ? If you have, it's an ongoing reality. You must confess him every day to sinners. Someone did for you. Someone shared Jesus with you. 
make the great confession. Enter in the journey of living out the great commandment. Get in on the mission, the great commission. That's what Jesus, who lived a perfect life, died a tragic, savage death on the cross, bearing there our sin, that we might become righteous in the sight of God by faith in Him, rising from the grave, proving that everything He promised was true of Him is true, and every promise He made to us is true. Oh, will you make the great confession of faith in Christ today? Let's pray.